Hi, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It's Alicia, and I'm very excited to be with you today for our global weekly online fireside chat. Today, I'm broadcasting to you live once again from a very early San Francisco, California, looking over Twitter's headquarters here in Midtown San Francisco. I've had the most amazing week and be meeting with some truly spectacular entrepreneurs, one of which has built no less than seven unicorns. That's seven one billion dollar companies. That's why we do these global online fireside chats so we can all learn from the best. As always today, we have an amazing session planned for you. We have a panel of brilliant VIP gurus joining us from across the globe, logging in to help you close your very first big deal on your path to building your own unicorn. I'm sure we have all so much to learn today from our VIP guests. So I know you want to get going with all those questions. Now I've got you all excited. Let me go ahead and introduce you to our VIP guests before asking them to properly introduce themselves to you. Welcome to Island-based Joe Dalton, who's a business growth strategist, digital marketer, broadcaster, and business coach. Welcome to Jamaica-based Michael Gordon, who's a technologist, enterprise disruptor, and fintech specialist. Welcome to Johannesburg, South Africa-based Matt Clark, who's a marketing strategist, consultant, business development expert, and sales expert. Welcome to globally-based Toby Dawson, who's a business development expert and global leader. And welcome to Ukraine-based Igor Pirelli, Pirelli, who's a serial entrepreneur, business developer, and maker. Now, I know you want to hear from them, so let me go ahead and ask them to introduce themselves to you, starting with Joe. Joe, please say hi to everyone. Hi, folks. Thank you. Uh, calling from lovely, sunny Dublin, the, uh, the Emerald Isle. Uh, I've been in business around 28 years. Uh, I love helping companies uh, develop new leads and new concepts of bringing in business through marketing and teaching them how to sell and how to close those deals. Uh, I started selling at a very early age of 14, which was baked potatoes. And by the time I was 23, 24, I was making a turnover around 3.5 million a month. So uh, times have been good for myself. Love it, love it, love it. This is the sort of entrepreneur we love learning from everyone. Welcome, Joe. Toby, do you want to say hi to everyone? Yeah, hi there. So I'm Toby, and um, I'm currently living in Mexico, but I'm from London, and I've been um, I've been working in business development for 20 years, um, mainly at big blue chip companies like Google, where I've been helping publishers monetize all their um, advertising inventory from display to video to mobile, and also helping advertisers and agencies maximize their performance across Google and across the digital web from their advertising. Um, I left to become a partner in a propriety um, algorithmic trading platform in the cryptocurrency space. And we're, um, we're doing really well. We're, we're, we're only, we only launched in January. We're, we're very profitable already. And we're doing about, I think we're doing about $50 million every quarter in terms of trades right now. Absolutely superb. Very excited to joining us today, Toby. Welcome to our very first Jamaican guest ever. Michael, say hi to everyone. Hi everyone, how are you all doing? Um, my name is Michael Gordon, as I'm based in Jamaica. I have about some 20 years experience in the technology field. I was formerly a project manager with a mobile money startup focusing on financial inclusion. I'm presently involved in um, building an e-commerce platform with some logistics capabilities. I've been several years in banks and other financial agencies. I'm glad to be here to share you know, and learn. Thank you, Michael. And from sunny South Africa, Matt, say hi to everyone. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Clark, and it definitely sounds like I'm the youngest person <laughs> on the chat uh, with a little less than 20 years' experience. Um, I help seven- and eight-figure companies to grow and scale, and we do this by creating all the digital assets that they need to attract their ideal clients and then build the online sales funnels to bring in the high-quality leads uh, and then convert and keep them. Uh, you know, some of the things that we, we've done with our clients is, you know, they've experienced 10 times growth in their business. We've personally experienced 300% growth year on year. You know, we've seen clients get a thousand percent ROI from their investment. And, um, you know, my background is door to door sales. So automation really appealed to me because there's, you know, nothing more manual than going on knocking on some doors in the freezing cold weather in the UK. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Welcome, Matt. And last but definitely not least, Igor, please say hello. 
<laughs> Hi everybody, I'm serial interpreter. I have experience developing e-commerce business, business from scratch and grow it in 20,000 percent in one year from Ukraine and Russia. Now working in uh, uh, launching new startup in service marketplace platform to help nail services and their customer uh, make uh, their work more convenient and more um, security. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Very excited you're joining us today, Igor. Just before we jump into our questions for our VIP guests, a few shout outs. Here goes. On the screen are contact details for our VIPs. Feel free to reach out to them. I know they love hearing from you. Keep sending your questions through to inspireme at onlinefiresidechat.com and we will always do our very best to include them. Given how many of you are joining us today, we have community champions managing the chat room. So if, a, if you have a question for one of our VIPs, as we say, we'll do our best to get it answered. Just a reminder, we have community champions and ever-growing meetup groups in over 80 cities and 57 countries around the globe, including in North and South America, the UK, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, India, Asia, and Australia. If you'd like to meet up with one of your local chapters or you'd like to start your own, feel free to reach out to us via email and we'll do our very best to connect you with our local community champion. On that note, thank you to all our volunteer champions from around the globe. You know this, Thank but we can't say it enough. You're the heart and soul of our community, and we wouldn't be here today without you. Over the next few months, and with all your help, we'll be sharing with and inspiring entrepreneurs in more than 100 countries. Together, we know that we can make this happen. Thank you again to our VIP guests for sharing your knowledge and wisdom so freely with our global community. Thanks to our growing family of supporters and collaborators from around the developing world, who once again hosting sessions for hundreds of entrepreneurs who don't have access to the necessary bandwidth or understanding the English language to join their session, our sessions on their own. Thank you to all the presidents, prime ministers, ambassadors, government ministries, UN offices, US embassy corners, British council, council offices, university campuses, schools, business incubators, chamber of commerce, community centers, and community radio stations for all your weekly ongoing hosting support and for raising awareness within your regions and communities. Thank you to everyone from our UN Women team for all your support as well. Once again, we stream you across new live platforms due to the support of all our champions. If you'd like us to broadcast a community in your area and empower and inspire more entrepreneurs and let us know and we would love to connect with your community. Now the moment you've all been waiting for, you want to learn from the best, they are here. So our topic for today, our global online fireside chat, how to close that first big deal as an entrepreneur. To make our, our VIPs feel nice and comfortable, we're going to start with an easy question that we're going to pose to one of our VIPs. So VIPs, get ready. And then we are going to listen to your answers and learn and take notes. And if any of our other VIPs would like to answer the question as well, free, feel free to let me know. And we'd love to learn from you too on that topic. So here goes, starting with Toby. Toby, let's do it. Toby, we hope you're ready. So make yourself nice and comfortable. In all businesses, even trading businesses, shopkeepers are always very keen to get that first deal of the day. You've got this extraordinary experience working across sectors, working with some of the biggest companies in, your, in the world. In your experience, do you believe there's something to getting that first deal done? Toby, let's hear it. Did we lose Toby? Let's ask Joe to open this one up. Joe, do you want to go for it? Yes, of course. There's that, that first day will open up so many doors. For one thing, it's momentum. We all growing through businesses have, you know, we have our good days and our bad days. But when you get to close that first deal, it picks you right up and you feel more confident to go and chase the second and then the third and the fourth. So the answer to your question, yes, that first one, sets the bar for how you're going to do for the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Thank you, Joe. Great start to today's session. Matt, any thoughts in terms of what Joe was saying? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe something a little bit different as well as something that I've seen that really helps to get that big deal and to, to really close that big deal is preparation. You know, go in prepared. Don't go in completely, you know, and without anything done or anything prepared before. Um, and this goes anything from small deals right the way up to big deals. You know, the more you know your client, the more you're prepared to deal with them, the more you're prepared to tackle their questions and answers, um, the quicker that you're going to be able to walk them across the line. Uh, you know, we've seen massive deals close. And, you know, even in my door knocking days where we're signing, you know, $100,000 deals in an hour and a half. Um, 
And it's all about the preparation, you know, going in, knowing your product, knowing your service and having that belief, man. There's nothing that beats that true and pure belief in what you do. Thank you, Matt. Fascinating insights being shared by you and Joe today. Michael, your perspective from Jamaica, would you agree with your co-panelists in terms of closing that very first big deal and gaining that necessary momentum? Completely. I mean, your first client, they move to the team and gets it going for your next. Um, of course, as I said, planning is important. You need to identify candidates and remove, identify them, study them, and remove all the reasons for them not to want to work with you. Um, what I found is the most useful um, approach is to partner with an NGO where you can help solve a large problem and become integrated in the supply chain of an underserved community. I mean, once you make yourself integral to, to all the business processes, you, you naturally become, you know, you, you, people, you, you, people come to you, you know, you own up a channel of opportunities. It's fascinating you talk about partnering with an NGO and we'd like to come back to that, Michael, because we definitely see a drive towards that globally and how it actually helps entrepreneurs. And I'm sure your co-panelists have some thoughts on that too, so we'll definitely come back there. So um, Toby's back. Toby, given the fact that that question was directed at you, please share your insights on this. We seem to have lost our... Toby, are you back from Mexico? Sorry, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Go for it, Toby. Please share that. your insights on that question. Yeah, I was saying that the other guys answered the questions um, pretty well, but obviously from our perspective, getting the first deal in for a new business is really important because it gives, gives the business a lot of confidence, makes them aware that they've got a good product that they can sell. But also what we try to do is we try to we try to um, be in business from people that are well connected with other people so we can actually use them as references as well and try to be in more business. Um, but gem generally, I agree with what the other people were saying. Thank you, Toby. Now, jumping right in, because I know this is a question that's been directed at you from our community. Toby, in your opinion, how critical is it in terms of increasing your deal size to help create progress and the success of your company as you're building the company? Please share your thoughts. Um, yeah, so in my experience in previous companies, we've tended to build um, partnerships over time. So we're, we're often um, generating um, good results, good business, good revenue, but we grow the partnership by having an ongoing dialogue with the partner and try to help them grow and make them always, always keep them aware of all the new products and features where they can spend more money. But we find that um, developing business and growing the business by introducing new ideas and new ways for the partner to make money um, is always incredibly valuable. Thank you, Toby. Matt, I have a feeling you've got some thoughts in terms of increasing deal size <laughs> to drive progress and the success of your company. Please let us hear those thoughts. Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, I've worked with uh, companies all over the world and not necessarily in the retail space, you know, more in the business to business space. And, um, you know, a lot of the times what we find is, you know, what gets you from zero to 100,000 in terms of deal size is a completely different ballgame when you go to a million and then to 10 million and then further on. So your company dynamics change and you need that cash flow to actually make the business go further as you bring on more expenses. But you know, a lot of the times what I see when I work with people is that they don't actually understand the true value of their time and of their services and of their actual worth. Um, so you know, one of the first things that, that we look at when we, when, we do, when we deal with people is what are they charging? What is their time worth? Because nine times out of 10, people are undercharging for their services. So what lands up happening is that they work too hard and don't have enough time and land up just paying bills, you know? So some people are working 18 hour days, but not making the money that they want to make, which is really sad. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done the same thing and we've worked with people where their prices have increased four or five times and they have more people buy because they have a, a better value proposition. So adding that value proposition can increase your prices and I highly recommend it um, because I mean, hey, who doesn't want to charge more, work less and feel great about it? I'm going to jump right in there, Matt, because I think as entrepreneurs, we all have this problem. In your yep. opinion, why do we actually do this? Is it low self-esteem? Do we not value ourselves enough? And are there some tools in it to kind of start mm. removing these inborn bad habits that ultimately damage our businesses 
so we can get this growth going. Please share your insights because I know this is a struggle sure. we all have. Definitely. Well, you know, the biggest thing is that most people think that their worth is the amount that they're putting on the invoice, you know, or what they're charging for their services. The, they don't actually understand that their true worth is the experience that they've gained over the past couple of years. You know, all of us as entrepreneurs and business owners invest in ourselves. And I'm not talking about in school because, you know, we don't pay those bills. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't attend uh, college or university or, everything, or anything like that, but I've spent a lot of money, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars educating myself and getting myself up to that level. So most people realize, they don't realize that that's actually their true worth. Um, and there's actually a formula for calculating, you know, what your hourly rate should be uh, and then translating that into how you price your products and services. And this is so fascinating because I've heard this globally. It doesn't matter how successful entrepreneurs are. If we don't have this breakthrough, we damage mm -hmm. our businesses. So thank you for sharing this, Matt. Incredible insights. Joe, please share your insights in terms of what Matt was saying. Yeah, definitely. As I always say to my clients, if you're too busy, you're underpricing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, mo most companies, there's two issues that most startups have. Is one is they, they don't realize the cash flow that they need to get the business up and running. And secondly, they don't realize how long it takes to close that first deal. It's very important that you sell value all the time, always looking at your price. You mentioned there, why do people sell at a very low price? Is it self-esteem? I think one of the things is, yes, they're not sure about where they are placing themselves in the marketplace. So everyone goes in at the low end and as eventually as confident builds and they get those few extra deals, then they start stepping up the market, upping their prices and then moving into a different category. And once they start dealing with bigger clients, charging more, the quality of the client improves and also they get more respect and better work from the client as well. Joe, again, you've touched on some fascinating insights. And Toby, given the fact that you've worked where you've worked and you've dealt with the clients you've dealt with, please share your opinion on this on this topic. Yeah, I mean, this is where I would say it is actually very different from working at Google to where to where I am now. Um, because now we're sort of selling performance. Essentially, we're we're, we're helping people make money. <laughs> it's a very different sale to helping people, helping somebody represent their business to make money in terms of advertising for their business. So this is a lot more direct. So we're actually basically um, providing real value to investors um, by showing them how they can actually profit from our business. So we, we try to compete. We, we try to look at what our competition is doing. And we generally try to find a solution that we think is more valuable for our investors and partners than our competition have. So I, we're not too worried about giving a good, a good deal. Um, I'm quite happy to give a good deal as long as we're profitable. And as long as it gives us the opportunity to grow our business much faster, and that would usually be through additional products or through um, introductions to other potential investors. Thank you, Toby. Michael, any thoughts you'd like to share here before we jump on to our next question? Uh, well, um, pricing is a good strategy where if you are trying to get in, um, get a contract with a very large um, player who has a, a large customer base and you can get access to that customer base. Um, what you need to do is ensure you have a good relationship with the investors that they'll provide that cash flow where to, um, to continue to support you while you build this customer base and develop ways of monetizing it as you go forward. But as, as, as someone said before, it's important to us and know the market and find ways, identify what price point your customers can afford it and what price point your competitive there. Um, and your competitors. Thank you, Michael. You touched on something very interesting once again that we'd love you as a panel to share with us throughout our session, this idea of entrepreneurs partnering with big players to help you actually drive your momentum and give you the necessary cash flow to keep growing. Moving on to our next question in this regard, um, we're going to direct this one to Toby and it goes to all our panelists. Toby, do you believe that it is better to hold out for big deals or take the smaller deals as they come along? Um, obviously, big deals are much better, but generally, I try to get a feel for where I think the partner can grow to. So some of my biggest deals ever in my, in my business development world have started off quite small, like surprisingly, even from big brands occasionally, 
really, really small tests, but you work very closely with the partner. You show them how they can grow and how things are performing, and, and you tend to grow them. But obviously, um, it's very hard to get a really, really big multi-million dollar deal off, 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 off the block. But if, you can, if you've got a bit of flexibility to let somebody test in a smaller way, but show them how they can obviously get to be that really big deal, then I think that's a lot more valuable. And I find that um, relationship building has a major impact on how you can grow a partner over time. So I, I wouldn't say no to a small deal unless I thought it would always remain a small deal. If it was a small deal that could grow and become potentially huge, then obviously I'm the kind of person that would like to take it as long as we have the resources to, to, to implement it and manage it properly. So thank you, Toby. You touched on something very interesting, the idea of resources, managing a property. Often our businesses are small. We have small teams as entrepreneurs. I'm asking this to you as well as your co-panelists. How do you make sure that you don't expend too much resource on the small test in the hope that it becomes a big client and very valuable to your company? Toby, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it does happen occasionally. And um, we, we've got ways of bringing in extra, extra resources, working through third parties. But with a small test, you really want to be, if you think it's going to grow to be, become a big partner, you don't really want to pass them on to a third party. So you want to give them that personal, personal approach. Um, really, it comes down to a lot of um, typical negotiation and sales tactics. You've really got to find out from speaking to the partner and from pushing them and find out if they really are going to be a viable big partner. Otherwise, sometimes I think there's a lot of value in saying no. You can actually say, look, we've got some really big clients right now. Um, we haven't got the resources for this, but we'll keep in touch. We'll, when you're ready in a few months' time, we'll try to get you involved at that point. So, so it's, it sort of brings value by being brave and saying, look, we really want your business, but right now we physically also, we have, have not got the resources to take it. But we are interested and we are growing. And as soon as we're... As soon as you've got more people, we can take on we can take on more business. Now, can I can you. I jump in there? Just yeah. give us one second, there, Jonah. To our entire community, what Toby has just shared is incredibly valuable experience and insights because it's a mistake we all as entrepreneurs make. The ability to be brave and tell your customers or potential mm -hmm. customers to go on hold until you're ready can make or break your business. So thank you for sharing that, Toby. Matt's got some insights, and then Joe, we'd love to hear from you. Matt, please go for it. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I agree with everything that Toby is saying. Uh, I just want to take a step back because I also think that it depends at what stage of the business that you're in. And for a lot of people that, you know, that I've personally seen out there is that, you know, you first need to understand who is your ideal target market. Like who is your ideal client that you want to deal with and have that written down in bullet point form. Because if you don't know who that is, you don't know who to say yes to and you don't know who to say no to. And where these guys, where you can actually start on these small deals and give them a taste and then grow them to become, you know, multi-million dollar or pound or whatever your currency is deal, you need to know that this is an ideal client that I want to work with. This is somebody that I want to invest in so that I can actually get them to that next level and make that kind of money. Um, so it's a very big part of it is understanding who your ideal client is so that you know to say yes or no to them. You know, sometimes you'll take that risk on that small deal uh, to get the bigger deals coming through at a later stage. But if you haven't got that clearly defined, how do you know what to do? Or how do you know who to say yes and no to? Again, today is an awesome session. We are learning from the best. Thank you, Matt. Clarity of purpose as entrepreneurs, critical to our success. Joe, please go for it. Share your insights. Yeah, I was just, I, I would agree with what Matt and Toby have said. Um, Matt, you said it, the avatar, building that avatar. But I also believe that it's, it's very important that when you are in that sales process that you're asking the right questions and qualifying. From mm -hmm. there, you'll get, a, you'll get an idea of who your client is. In the past, I've had clients that were screaming to do business with us they were throwing money on the table and we we turned them down because we felt that they weren't the right uh, mix for us uh, we would have felt that we wouldn't have been working with them we would have been working for them and sometimes you have to look at the client and go is it are these going to work for me forget about the money yes go with it if you get that good feeling walk away a shout out to our entire community these insights are worth 
more money than you can ever imagine because the idea that you turn customers down is foreign as entrepreneurs, but this is what makes you, the panelists today world class at what they do. So everybody, please take note at what uh, Toby, Matt, and Joe just shared. Michael, we've got some insights from you. Please go ahead. Right, um, definitely. I mean, in designing your business and raising your funds, you want to choose, you want to identify who is the ideal partner, who your market is. Um, in our experience, um, our situation uh, in my previous uh, previous company I was with was that there was a regulatory issue. Um, a lot of the large banks, a lot of the large telecoms, they couldn't get a mobile money license. But we identified um, a particular NGO who had a stakeholder community, some 500,000 people. And we worked with them and the Bank of Jamaica to, to craft um, a, a, some kind of a, a, a permit, you know, a non objection. Which would would allow us to develop the mobile money technology and go forward. So in doing that, we um we gave the bank what the BOJ what they wanted uh, a test bed and the, and the DBJ um an opportunity to 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 efficiently distribute funds and to monitor and to monitor in real time the effect of their funding. So I'm there. Yes, yeah, so you have to study your market and choose the right the right partner. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. On that note, this question goes to Joe, and then we're going to ask it to our panel. Joe, you had extraordinary success at a young age. Clearly, you were a born entrepreneur. How did you go about starting to find your first big deal? Research. Uh, knowing who my client was. As I said, I you'd pick the avatar, pick the market or the segment that you were looking to get in touch with. I realized that everybody was trying to get in touch with these people through online or through email. So what I did, I sat down, analyzed the people that I wanted to work with, found the key players in the company. And then instead of sending them email, I wrote letters. And in the letters, I put, look, can you help me out? I'm looking for some advice. Um, maybe you've been in business a long time and you could help me out. And in return, I got a reply going, yes, uh, we, a lot of companies, big companies out there, when you're not a bear and you're starting off, they like to help. They like to see new people coming up. And that's the approach I took. And from there, um, had a meeting with them, spoke about what we were doing. And eventually then they came, came partners with ourselves. So it's just persistence and know who you're chasing. Never give up. On that note, take us back to when you were 14 and you were starting out. How did you do it? Because a lot of entrepreneurs, are, I guarantee, are thinking, how did he start so young and get it so right? Uh, scared, I, I just have always been very confident. Um, you know, I, at an early stage, at, you know, my mother would say I could stand up in front of an audience of three, four thousand people and sing to them, even though I can't sing. But uh, yeah, it was my, my first was, it was actually a stall, a little stall selling baked potatoes, got the idea. There was a, a conference on in Dublin and uh, got, got the, the money together and um, just start pitching people. And I, and I realized at a very young age, I love to sell. I was born to sell and I could write my own check. And that's where I was. It was just knocking on doors. And then when I was about 18, I was involved in um, printing and office equipment, and I was with a company, and I basically took a briefcase uh, from from their from their location, put a load of brochures, and I walked the length and breadth of a, of a town, knocking on doors, uh, telling people who we were, and the business just grew rapidly from there. So I've I've it's just natural. Don't be fearful. You know the only thing that that people are frightened of. Is fear itself. If you want to be successful in, in any business, you need to step out of your comfort zone and speak to people. The more spe people you speak to, the more people will buy from you. Extremely inspiring, Joe. And I think the idea of people who do people do business with people they like is critical to what you're saying because clearly a lot of people like you a lot and wanted you to succeed. So, uh, Matt, I know you got some insights here you'd like to share. Please go for it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Joe, lovely story, man. You know, because I I started off uh, with my career knocking doors in the UK, selling gas and electric. Uh, you know, in the freezing cold. <laughs> 
Yep, you know all about that, don't you? I do, I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> one of my, one, my, my first big deal actually kind of, it fell into my lap um, in a sense. Uh, you know, I say that very loosely. Uh, I went and I was chatting to a guy and I say fell into my lap, but what really happened was the opportunity presented itself and I had the preparation to push the boundaries a little bit. And I decided to actually just take the chance and throw some crazy numbers out there and the guy turned around and said yes. And that was the first, from there I never went back because after that I just decided that if one person could say yes, then another person could say yes, then another person could say yes, and another person could say yes. And in going through that process, I just decided that I don't want to do small deals anymore. You know, unless I've got a platform where I can sell millions of them. You know, I always look at it as, you know, you can either sell a lot for a little or a little for a lot. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting dynamics and it's a lot of fun. Um, so, I mean, one of my first big deals fell into my lap. And then when we started getting really clear on who we wanted to deal with, when I started my telecoms company, we only dealt with the bigger guys. And, you know, while other people were selling the same services uh, with the same products, you know, our prices were more than double what they were selling. And we were selling three times more product than them. So, you know, all about the belief in the product and knowing exactly who your target market is, because once you know who that is, you can actually craft your message to suit them. You know, they've got different needs and different problems. And, you know, if you know exactly who they are, you can craft your message to suit them and deal with those objections as they come along. It makes it a lot easier. So, Matt, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> advice in terms of our entrepreneurs actually choosing a crazy number, even if it seems crazy when it comes to trying to do that deal. What are your thoughts? Can they do it? Should they do it? And how crazy should that number be relative to, <laughs> to their competitors? Man, so it really all depends on you and depends on, you know, if you're going to pull a bit of a ballsy move and just go for it. You know, I would say is that if you're selling a product already for a certain price, okay, um, you know, it depends also if it's products or services. Services are a lot easier to charge more. Products, um, you, it needs a little bit more positioning. In terms of services, I would say if you're selling a service right now, double it at least, you know, if you're selling a product right now, increase it by 10%, increase it by another 10% and gradually start increasing it and change your messaging to suit your, your person. But if you're selling a service, double it at least. Yeah. We have rock stars on today's call, everybody. These guys are the <laughs> best in the business. Toby, you have worked with some of the biggest brands. Tell us your thoughts in terms of what Matt was saying. <laughs> Please share. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, if I'm, Working for a startup now, I think, and we literally did this, we only did, we only started in January. There's a, there's a huge change going from Google where you've got um, a huge amount, you've got a huge support network behind you. You have consultants, you have video, rich media, mobile experts that you can pull into any meeting that's relevant. Being a, in a startup, I've got to do everything on my own. So it's quite interesting. Um, but from a, from a deal perspective, I think as a, as a small company, you, you need to get going. So the first deal, you can it can almost be a lost leader sometimes because it's gonna really you're gonna really learn from it. You're gonna be able to bring in more partners by using it as a as a testimonial or reference and hopefully generate more more leads from that. But for me, the, the actual products that we're selling, we we sort of sell performance. So it's not as if we can give someone a much better deal. We we, we always try to give them the best deal possible anyway. And, if, and we report to them on a very regular weekly or monthly basis so they're comfortable in how they're performing. And that regular feedback we get from them easily lets us, lets us um, upsell them or get more investment out of them because they know they're doing well. So that regular contact is very, very important. But from my perspective, I think bringing the first deal is, is, is vital. It really depends on the products and services that you're selling. Um, but, but yeah, the first deal, sometimes you can... You can you know, almost drop your pants a bit to get that first aid in, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Toby. I know Michael had a few quick insights there. Uh, Michael, do you want to just jump on in before we move on to our next quick question? Yeah, um, definitely. You can use a last leader um, getting that reference because one of the biggest selling points is that this price was credibility by history. Um, but in terms of those mechanics, you need like a strong, with technology people, so you need a strong demo team and a strong IT team. 
and you, you, you go forward and you select like a, a group of maybe 20 people, you sell on the market, you choose these 20 or so people, and you just pursue them, you do demos, get them to know your name, you know, go out there and conferences and meetups and so on and so forth, and, 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 and study your competitors and try to be better than them. Uh, you know, and eventually you get a deal. Thank you for touching on that, Michael, because it's one of the first things we learned when we moved to the US, the critical importance of a strong demo team. It's not something that should be overlooked. It's something that you, you should create mastery in itself because these are your brand going out there. And Joe, I'm sure you've got some fascinating insights you want to share here, and then I'd love to ask you our next question. Yes, yeah, certainly. It, 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 there's just two things. One is it, it's this, it costs the same amount of time and effort to sell something for a thousand as it does to sell something for 20,000. You know, the time, the research that you put in. A lot of companies as well, when they're going out to sell, when they get that appointment, I see them and they come in and they say, we're brilliant, this is what we do, I'm great, I'm beautiful, and our product is great. Instead of sitting down with the client in that initial interview and going, what is your problem and how can we solve it? And there's three critical questions that I ask everyone when I'm in, in a meeting. One, what are you doing now? What's working? What's not working? And the fourth question then, where do you want to be in the future? And I sit back after those questions. And if the people are talking to me for an hour plus, I know that I have a client ready to go. Thank you, Joe. I'm writing down everything as you speak. So we're all learning here today. And you made me laugh when you said it's uh, it's easy. It's the same amount of work to sell both those amount those products. I remember Donald Trump said that many, many, many years ago. So thank you for sharing that. Talking about that, um, another an, a, a big issue for a lot of entrepreneurs in our community is the balance between sales and marketing. And especially when it comes to finding a deal, how much emphasis should they give to the sales component? How much emphasis should they give to the marketing component? Joe, we'd love for you to share your insights. And then, of course, we'd like to ask Matt, Toby, and Michael as well. So, Joe, please go for it. I think if a company doesn't spend money on marketing, it's a hobby. Um, I think that you should be initially when you're doing a startup, you'll spend more money on building your marketing than you will on your sales. But as time moves on, You'll, you're, you'll, and you start building those clients and you're building your platform, you'll reduce in your marketing and concentrate more on your sales. You should be spending, I believe, up to 10-15% um, of your turnover on marketing each year. Depending on the industry that you're in, you'll be focusing on what marketing. Um, online inbound marketing is very popular at the moment. We're, we're doing a mixture ourselves between inbound marketing and direct mail as in personalizing letters out to clients warming them up driving them to our website so in the beginning i always say direct marketing don't try and i always believe small entrepreneurs try and go out and go i'm going to build a brand i'm going to be brilliant and this is a brand it takes an awful long time to build a brand. But if you do segmentation and do a proper marketing strategy, direct marketing, you'll get a better response. Fascinating insights, Joe. And I know Toby would have some thoughts in terms of this. Toby, when trying to find that deal, in your opinion and based on everything you know, what's more important, sales or marketing? Um, it's quite funny you asking me this, actually, and especially based on the last answer. Um, obviously, being an advertising marketing guy, I have I believe in I believe in marketing, and certainly if you go to somebody like Google, you can you can create marketing that can generate response. You can create marketing that can generate your brand very well. The issue we have is we're in a we're, we're an investment fund, and we're not actually allowed to advertise. <laughs> so I tend to do all my marketing these days through my business development contacts, through my through my main contacts, and um, I build up a pipeline of around five hundred people. And these were generally people that I'd um, gathered from my 20 years of working at Google and other places. So everybody who I thought was a viable partner for us, um, I, I tend to spam and call all the time and email them. And I, I basically choose them as being a viable partner by a few things. One is, uh, would they be interested in our business? What, what is our business? We're a digital algorithmic trading platform. So people that are interested in investments, 
people that are interested in technology, and people that have money are basically our main, our main, um, um, the people that we're going for, our main audience. So I, I do a lot of my own marketing, but at the moment, I tend, it really is a lot of um, chasing, emailing, calling. Um, but we, as a business, we're not allowed to advertise. We can, uh, we can only we can only present our products to people that are interested in, in the space. So it's, it's a tricky one, but I definitely am a big believer in, in advertising. But I also know that it can be for a small business. It can be the easiest way to burn your money. So you've really got to be very clever about how you spend your advertising money because it's so easy to waste 99% of your money. I really believe in internet advertising because you can measure the performance and track the results and track the sales and track the branding. You can measure it. It was no accident that we asked you that question, Toby. So thank you for your insights. Matt, please share your insights in terms of what Joe and Toby were saying. Yeah, so uh, Joe, I'm sorry, Toby brought up a really good point there in that, you know, internet marketing, you can actually track everything that's going uh, that's going on. So you can keep a track on your on your marketing spend. Um, so it also depends on, on where you are in your business. You know, if you're a solo entrepreneur, if you've got a very small team and you're the salesperson or you're the marketing person, you know, it's going to be a very different ballgame as if you're doing seven or eight figures. So, you know, if it is a small team of, uh, of people and you're managing everything yourself, then, you know, you need to spend three to four hours a day doing sales and marketing, you know, yeah. not really one more than the other, but you need to spend that time every single day doing sales and marketing, hitting the phones, knocking doors, hell, whatever it takes, you know, the going online, you know, as Toby said, it's very easy to go online and spend money on the internet. And yes, you can track it, but it's a lot easier going online and putting some ads up than going and knocking on some doors or, or making, picking up the phone and making some phone calls, you know? It's a lot less daunting because you don't have to speak to somebody. Whereas if your business is in a bigger stage and you're doing, you know, six, seven, eight figures, you've got a very different model, right? So this is where your marketing becomes incredibly important. But at the same time, if you don't have systems, your sales systems and structures to support those marketing efforts, you're going to get lots of leads falling through the crack and it actually does more damage to your brand than anything else. So you can get your brand out there, but if there's no one following up on those leads, there's no one closing those leads, and you don't have a system to track them and actually uh, and, and bring them across that line, it's going to fall flat. You know, one of the one of my mentors, uh, you know, says, what I do is that you know the secret to my success is I make an offer and then I follow up like crazy, and you know, following up with people is where you make your money. You know, it's not that initial contact and most people give up after one or two contacts, you know, and most deals are done are signed. 80% of deals are signed after five contacts. So you need to have multiple points of contact to talk to people. And if you don't have your systems and structures in place to do that, you're going to lose out on a lot. And it doesn't matter. I mean, I've seen people lose a lot of money, even as six, seven and eight figure businesses because of exactly that. Absolutely brilliant insights being shared, and I'm coming back to direct the next question at you, Matt. Michael just had some <laughs> insights on this question. Michael, right. please go for it. Well, right. um, as, 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 as a previous speaker just said, you have two types of products. If you're a consumer product, then you're looking more at um, social media and um, airplay, and a lot of door-to-door marketing, you know, uh, a massive wrong game. If you're more of an enterprise sales, it's more personal, where you 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 you're working on a reputation in your firm. Um, you know, Oracle doesn't Oracle does some marketing, but when it's selling servers, they they have a personal relationship with each banker. Yeah? Um, so you need a strong sales pipeline, a strong sales team, qualify opportunities. You need to join business communities. Um, you want to be known as an authority in the field, so people come to you. I mean, for advice and guidance. You need to identify strong, exclusive deals. You know, you control the whole region. You know, so for that. Um, and be aware of your, your your customers' procurement cycles and their internal and external pressures. You know, that's I think is the best way. Again, fascinating insights, Michael. I know these are some lessons I learned the hard way. So thank you for sharing those. <laughs> Going, uh, Joe's got some insights there. Joe, jump on in. Please go for it. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I use this analogy with my clients about their websites. A lot of people believe, you know, they build a website and people will come. And I say a website is like a book on a shelf in a library. And the only way people will find that book on a li in a library if the librarian comes and shows them the book. Now think of the internet 
as your website, not competing against hundreds of other websites, but thousands. So it's important to use marketing to drive people to your business. That's all I Absolutely. have to say. Absolutely. Brilliantly said. Thank you, Joe. And we're coming back to you with our next question. We're going to open it up to Matt. Matt, based on what you know now, do you believe that focusing on a single geographic region is better than looking to source work from around the world? What do you think? Oh, I love working for, with people around the world, personally. Um, you know, you get just such different insights as to what goes on in business. And culturally, people think differently, they act differently, they respond differently. But it really does depend on your product and service. You know, are you able to do that internationally? Are you able to reach an international crowd? Are you able to deliver internationally? So it really depends on your product and service. And, you know, personally, based in South Africa, you know, our, our economy is, is uh, all over the show. And um, we, we have an interesting thing going on with our government. So there's some fun stuff going on. If I had to rely on one source of income and one place for my income, it would be a really tough time and I'd never reach my goals. But, you know, that's a personal thing. So it depends on what it is for, for each and every single person and it depends on what it is for their products and services. Um, you know, with the internet these days and websites and landing pages, it's so much easier to be able to reach an international audience. You can go online and specifically target people in a specific area that you want to sell to. And if you are going international, the more specific you are with where you're targeting, the better. I mean, I think we met over LinkedIn and I mean, look how cool this has turned out to be. You know, you can meet so many people and talk directly to the exact person that you want to talk to. It's the world has just become a lot more accessible. I wouldn't say a smaller place, it's pretty big still, but it's definitely a lot more accessible and you can reach the exact person that you want to talk to within a couple of minutes. Thank you, Matt. And you touched on some very interesting things, especially with regards to the South African situation. I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs <laughs> in South Africa and we're going through very difficult times. And communities such as ours prove that you can continue as an entrepreneur to hustle, yeah. keep building your business. I've seen extraordinary business opportunities come through our community as a result of conversations just like this. So thank you for highlighting that. I know Toby's got sure. some insights he wants to share. Toby, please go for it. I think we may have lost Toby there for a second. Joe, jump on in, please. Well, living in a country that has a, a population of 4.5 million. <laughs> I think that answers the question. But yes, as I believe as entrepreneurs who are starting out, they should start locally because they can give those first clients an, a, an extra service. As I say, you know, if you sell, um, three products and it's not to family or friends you have a business work locally as a starting out as an entrepreneur so you can then monitor how you're doing with your first initial clients and then once you're comfortable with your product comfortable with how you're handling your customer service then branch out into other countries <clears throat> Brilliant, brilliant insights, Joe. And if our entrepreneurs want to learn what it takes to build seven unicorns, what you just what you just said is basically what our unicorn entrepreneur said, that you, as long as you can sell, you can grow, but start local. So thank you for highlighting that, Joe. Brilliant insights. I know Toby's back with us. Toby, please go for it. Yeah, so again, it does really depend on the business, but the way the... The way I've built my current pipeline is people that I would say I've been working with over 20 years, people that either work at Google or work in companies I've sold to or have sold businesses to Google or people that I know have got good money. And um, out of my 400 strong pipeline, which are all potential $200,000 investors, I would say about 20% are in the US, 30% in the UK, 40% are in Mexico, just because I happen to be living here right now. Um, but we're very, very international. We, we will take business from everywhere. For us, it's just a trust thing. If, if you can get business from international, from foreign, that they trust you as much, then that's absolutely fine. Because I've um, been lucky to be working in an international business, I've actually done business in about 12 different countries, all over Europe, Japan, various countries like that. So I'm using and leveraging my, my relationships. The other thing is, is that in what we're doing, because we provide an investment opportunity for people to invest in cryptocurrencies or just invest in the cryptocurrency market. 
there are markets, for example, in Mexico, where the peso is very weak, or in um, Venezuela, where the, the local currency is almost dead, where you know there's a, a bigger opportunity to sell your investment opportunity because um, people are trying to get out of their local currency. So I think it's worth looking at where the good opportunities are, where the big profit for your business is. But from our perspective, I would say local in the terms of I know the people, but I would say international in terms of I don't care where they live as long as they're going to invest with us. <laughs> <laughs> Great yep. insight, Toby. Show, show me the money. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All sales Michael, people, yeah. There you go. Show me the money. We should all have that as a theme song. Michael, please uh, give us your insights. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, firstly, I mean, the plant is very small these days. I mean, we run services at Amazon, we raise funds in Silicon Valley, Singapore. But, um, but business is always personal and very local. So you're looking for, look, you're probably looking to build exclusive deals with local partners and regional dealers. Um, you got what I mean, you need to be aware of is, is, is local regulations and try not to violate them you know, and get shut down. I mean, that's another thing. If you mess up in one region, it spreads like Wi-Fi global. So, you know, but I mean, you operate globally, but you be, be very aware of the local situation. Fascinating insights, especially for our entrepreneurs in the emerging markets. Take note of what Michael just said. Now we're going to jump in. We've got a couple of questions that we know our entrepreneurs want on our panelists to answer. So we're just going to jump on in. I know our time is limited, but these are critical questions for very, very, very successful smart entrepreneurs. Let's quickly talk about closing deals. So let's jump on in, ask Joe to quickly answer this question. It goes to our other VIPs as well. Joe, once you start making progress on a potential deal, what steps should you take to try and close it as speedily as possible? You know, the first question that people always ask in the sales process is how do I close? It's beforehand, I always believe it's what you do before you go for the close. I use a, I use a very, very simple process. And sales is simple and it's very easy. And I call it the five C's. Contact categorize convince close and complete so in contact it's prospecting blueprinting following up categorize is completing your blueprinting that's asking the right questions creating in creating interest in your product and showing the person proof case studies or, or you know, testimonials then getting into convince which works on features benefits and real benefits and while you're in that mode, you're looking at buying signals, checking to see, looking at body language, looking what wording they're saying, checking them there. And then you go into trial close. A trial close is something like a thermometer that you check to see where the client is. Now, I use this. People love to think. Oh, no, people, sorry. People hate to think, but they love to give their opinion. So I would always say in a trial close, in your opinion, do you feel this? And they'll give me an answer. If I ask them, what do you think of this? They'll freeze up. By asking them their opinion, people love to give their opinion and they'll talk. And then from there, listen to what they're saying and you'll get an idea. From there, you can go into your close. If you get a positive response, you move forward. If you get a negative response, you go and find out what their objections are and handle those objections. And then from there, going back to the try to try close again, and then going into the sale, and then into complete. Joe, brilliant insights. We are going to invite you back. We need to hear more about this. I know our time today is limited, but yeah. brilliant, brilliant insights. You definitely coming back, Matt. We want your thoughts on this. Please go for it. Yeah, um, Joe. Yeah, this is just you know proper door to door salesman training. I love it. <laughs> so we use, <laughs> I mean, we were taught some pretty interesting stuff because you want to be able to close that deal as quick as possible. And, you know, we use something called the one to 20 game. And the goal of the one to 20 game is that there's two people play and the one person, the person who gets to 20 first wins. Now, as you're going through this process, most people, you know, get it wrong somewhere during the line and they think that they actually lose the game somewhere in the middle or somewhere towards the end. But the truth of the matter is, and this is, uh, you know, this is replicating the sale. The truth of the matter is that they lose it right in the beginning. 
you know, and it starts right from the time that you say hello, right from the time that you present yourself, right from the time that you start talking to people, you know, what are you bringing across? And, you know, because you need to have congruency in everything that you do, the way you look, the way you act, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, the way you dress. Um, it all needs to be congruent. And as you're going through that process, then, I mean, I'm not going to duplicate what Joe said, you bring all of that in. Okay, but you've got to realize that you don't lose the sale or you don't close right at the end. That starts all the way in the beginning. But something that I do to actually help close deals, and, and this is one of the things uh, and the questions that I always ask that have helped me close a lot of really, really big deals, is that I generally show them the return on investment that they can make if they, you know, if they take the solution or they work with me or whatever the case is. And then I ask the question, if I said to you that I could do X, Y, and Z for your business and show you a return of X, Y, and Z. What would that be worth to your business? What that does, and you, you just shut up and keep quiet. And what that does is that if you, you keep quiet and you wait for the client to actually, or the, the person you're talking to, to actually give you a number, and what they're actually doing is they are committing to a number without really knowing it or without being really cognizant of it. So, you know, if they tell you 3,000 pounds or whatever, then, you know, it depends on your approach. You can say, well, it's your lucky day. It's only going to be 2,499 and, you know, something along those lines. And you land up closing a lot bigger deals because then you actually start understanding what, that, what your product or service is of value to them and what they will pay for it. So it's quite awesome, interesting. Awesome insights. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So now, I'm sorry, everybody, we're running out of time, but our favorite part of today's session. We are going to go around our panel as quickly as possible, and then we're going to ask our panelists to prepare their tweet piece of advice. Starting with Toby, our question for you is, and it goes to our whole panel, and please tell us your answer as quickly as possible. Toby, what excites you in 2017, and what industries do you believe are ripe for disruption? Toby, go for it. Um, well, the industry I'm working in, um, cryptocurrencies, is, is possibly the most exciting industry I've ever been in since the internet began in like 1992 or, or whenever it was. Um, and I'm a big believer in, um, in in digital currencies and in Bitcoin really taking a, a larger share of the overall um, um, money around the world. So I, I would encourage everybody to at least buy one Bitcoin or one Ethereum, just hold it for five years and see what happens. But we're, we're very um, excited about our business. and um, I think I think the whole fintech sector <clears throat> is is going to grow so so fast. ICOs and, and cryptocurrencies is, is all I'm really interested in now. <laughs> it's it's addictive. I get it. I get it, Toby. <laughs> it yeah. gets the best of us. Joe, what excites you in 2017? What industries are ripe for disruption? What excites me? People are spending again. You know, we're, we're the a global recession is over and I can, you know, it's, it was the multinationals were, were spending about a year ago and that's trickling down to the people in the street. What injuries to tap into? I think every industry, I'm looking at video. I see video being a huge player for a lot of companies out there to try and get their message across. I'm really excited about accountants. They have lots of clients and they want to help those clients make money. And that's where marketing and sales comes in. Partner up with them. Fascinating insights. Very valuable advice there. Michael, what industries are ripe for disruption? What excites you in 2017? Well, um, I'm, I'm with Toby. I think the most exciting thing going on right now is in ICOs and the ability for anybody to just raise funds um, and gather a community around a project they believe in and just move those funds around globally. I think that is... It's, it's, it's probably the most important thing moving forward right now. Thank you, Michael. And last but not least, unfortunately, we've got one minute and we've got to quickly go through our tweets. So, Matt, keep it short, please. Let's do it. Sure. So, I'm really excited that, um, you know, people are making money again, exactly as, uh, uh, exactly as Joe said. But what's more exciting is that they're willing to share what they've learned and actually teach other people. So, absolutely, video is huge. Um, and for me, just the digital marketing industry is absolutely blowing up. I'm really excited about that. Love it, love it, love it. I'm taking notes from all of you as we speak. Now we're going to ask our VIPs to prepare their tweet piece of advice that we can go ahead and apply to our businesses and help ourselves succeed. Thank you to everyone for a truly amazing session. Just to keep you posted on our upcoming sessions, worth some of the world's best joining us once again. 
On the 13th of August, we have learning the art of finding investors who actually are helpful to your business and to your success. On the 16th of August, dangerous entrepreneurial behaviors and how to avoid them. On the 23rd of August, stop thinking and start doing. Is it really that easy? Do remember to keep us up to date on all your progress. We love hearing from you and our VIPs love hearing that you're succeeding. You can always email us at inspireme at onlinefiresidechat.com. You can find me as well as our VIPs and champions on LinkedIn. Remember, if you enjoyed today's session, keep inviting entrepreneurs to join our community. We need your help to get to our 100 country goal. We are changing the world through entrepreneurship. Now, let's ask our VIPs to please share their tweet piece of advice. Joe, get it. My piece of advice is preparation and persistence. We'll get to sale every time. Love it, love it, love it. Matt, hit it. Oh, Joe, you just took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> but I would say go online and use video. <laughs> love it, Toby. Your tweet piece of advice. Um, because I'm selling now to um, people that I've been working with for 20 years, I think the most important thing is having a very strong, um, trusted relationship with your partners. And, and always try and be seen as an expert. Always try and bring value in what you're doing. Very, very smart advice. Michael, hit it. I'm saying be bold and audacious. Um, be disruptive and innovative. <laughs> Love it. Brilliant way to close today's session. My tweet piece of advice, be grateful for everything you have. It is a privilege to be an entrepreneur, to be supported by people that love us and care about us. People such as these VIP guests, we are so lucky to learn. We must never be ungrateful for what we have created as a community. So thank you again to our VIP guests. Thank you to everyone for a truly amazing session. We want you to have an amazing week. Remember, as our VIPs have told you, to, to keep hustling and never, ever, ever give up. On the count of three, I'm going to ask our VIPs to shout bye, and we are going to invite them back again. I can promise you that. Guys, one, two, three. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. <laughs>